Do you remember the song? Don McLean took us to the levee, but the levee was dry and everybody there was drinking whiskey and rye. I always thought that bourbon and rye were the same thing, Tennessee whiskey. Put it all into the same pot, you might as well blend them all together. Well, last year, American bourbon, rye and Tennessee whiskey sales rocketed to over $2.9 billion in the US alone. Exports passed the billion dollar mark. But what are the artisanal distilled spirits doing and how important is the rise of mixology that's making cocktails to the whiskey industry? This is the money makers, or tonight it is the drinks makers. I'm Bruce Whitfield. Tonight I'm joined by Dave Pickerel. They call him Mr. Whiskey. That's whiskey with an E because the Scottish stuff, the Japanese stuff, they drop the, the E at the end. They get to the good stuff quickly. We're going to find out why the Distilled Spirits Council of the United States is trying to get South Africans to drink Tennessee's Finest. Dave, just take me through this now, please, because in the 80s, when I was spending late nights drinking bye-bye um, Miss American Pie, I really did think that Tennessee whiskey and bourbon and rye were all the same thing. Whiskey was Scottish yeah. and rye was bourbon and everything else. Yes, um, and it's a common misconception, and, and uh, they are all cousins of one another. They're, they're just minor differences, but the differences make a substantial difference in the taste profile. So bourbon, 51% maize or corn as yes, you would call it, correct. and rye must have at least 51% rye, which is a different grain. That's correct. So, so the maize or corn tends to be a sweeter uh, component. The, the rye tends to be a spicier component. And then with, uh, um, so, so you've got, uh, um, we, in this case, we're showing a, a two different rye, rye-based bourbons and a wheat-based bourbon. Um, so that you can see even within the realm of bourbon, there's differences. Okay, so but bourbon can be maize or mealies or uh, corn, corn. Um, as whatever you might call it or it could be rye based it's all bourbon yes as long as there's at least 51 percent corn the, the rest can okay. be rye can be wheat a little malted barley maybe and, um, and whiskey is whiskey worldwide whiskey is a is a generic category it's an umbrella yes any distilled spirit that's made from grain is whiskey. Okay. That's, but the that's Japanese are big into single malt. The Scots have made single malt really famous. The Even Irish, the Irish um, yes. are very good at, at making whiskey. I've been to a couple of distilleries around mm -hmm. there. What is the big significant difference then with American whiskeys um, versus what's happening for, for the East? That, that's, that, that's great. Um, and with the burgeoning cocktail culture in particular, um, what you find is that the American whiskeys play in the cocktail world far better than the malt whiskeys do. Um, there are, for instance, only four traditional malt whiskey cocktails. The, the Godfather, the, uh, the uh, um, Rusty Nail, the uh, um, nobody Blood to, and Sand. Nobody wants um, to waste nobody real wants whiskey, to, Nobody wants to do cocktails with, with malt whiskeys. Yeah. But there are dozens and dozens of classic cocktails, Manhattans, Old Fashions, Sazeracs, Juleps, on and on and on, well, that play with each of these. Cocktails were invented in America to make Prohibition booze taste better. Yes. So therefore, there is a, a natural thread, I guess, through the There is an, an, an historical thread. Mm. And now that the cocktail culture is emerging globally, um, the opportunity for American whiskey is, is just ex exploding. How is bourbon treated differently to make it different from the single malts? Um, and well, a number is obviously we start with different grains. Yep. Um, traditionally, malts, the grain is separated at the end of the mashing process, where with American whiskeys, the grain continues through all the way into the distillation process. All right. um, and then the maturation is substantially different. In America, you, you must start your whiskey in new barrels where in malt whiskey world, you start in used barrels. As a matter of fact, most scotch starts in American ex-bourbon barrels, which is kind of why I think the scotch has any residual good taste anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but take me through this. You were the master distiller here at Maker's Mark yes. for 14 years. Yes, I was. Um, so you, you, you are being very influential in the development of Maker's Mark. Um, here we've got Wild Turkey, and here we've got the Woodford Reserve. Now, for most South Africans, they'd be familiar with these names. They might not have tasted them, because right. most of our bourbon experience in South Africa has been through Jack Daniels. It's Correct. a bit like Johnny Walker is to the world of, of, of Scotch whiskey, yes. Jack Daniels is that's the generic. A, a, that's a, a, a very good analogy, is that, that, that you wouldn't begin to say that all whiskey is Johnny Walker. No. Um, but a lot of people have that same Johnny Walker mentality with Jack Daniels because Jack is really good at opening new markets. And mm. um, you know, I was at the, one of the most popular night spots in, in all of Cape Town last night. Five American whiskeys, four of them were Jack Daniels variants. Yeah. Um, and so it's obvious that Jack goes everywhere first. 
Um, so everybody would be familiar with that. He's a trailblazer. He it makes is. it possible for other producers. Yes. How many people are producing bourbon in the US right now? Because we've got the main brands and then right. doing what you're doing now, which is the new trend across all yes. drinks, really, into the artisanal market. In, in the artisanal market, there are literally hundreds, hundreds of small craft distilleries that are producing bourbon, some very glorious bourbons even, that, that are small niche products that, that uh, are spread all over the United States now. But it broadens the category and it makes the category that much more interesting um, and exciting. It, it, it makes it interesting, accessible, and, and in the craft space in particular, I, I like to say you can't out makers mark makers mark. Mm. And what I mean by that is if a craft person says, I want to make a product that tastes just like makers mark, if they're successful perfectly, what do they do? Say, it tastes just like Makers and it's and only $20 more a bottle? And what was the Who point? Who buys that? What was right, the point? Exactly. <laughs> so, so in the craft space, yeah. you have to make your own mark, which means you find new and interesting things. Uh, I have a, one of my distilleries that I work with has a Solera aged bourbon. It's the first one ever in the world. Solera, Spanish brandy. Yes. Um, and you age then the bourbon in those Solera casks. In the Solera system. Okay. With the four criaderas mm -hmm. and the whole deal. Um, others have learned to, to finish their whiskeys in port casks or, or, or uh, Amontillado or whatever. And, and uh, um, so some people are even, even trying peat smoke in bourbon and just all kinds of nuances just to create this versatility and this, this uh, extra, um, extra market share. It, it's, it's late at night. It's after nine o'clock. Um, I'm sleeping under the desk. So I'd like to try some, please, if Great. you don't mind. Where do we start? We started with, uh, with one where you helped. Did you create it? I did not you create it. Um, so it predates I, you. It was, uh, poor, poor, poor. there Come were, there were uh, literally about 75,000 cases in the United States when I started Plenty. consulting. And well, it glugs for a long time before okay. it actually comes out. All right, just checking. Just checking. <laughs> but uh, by the time I left Maker's Mark, it was 1.56 million cases. Okay. Um, you made Makers, your mark. I, we did. Yes. We made our mark. And Maker's is uh, is one of the more approachable bourbons because they use wheat as their flavoring grain instead mm. of rye, which is a lot more mellow. It's very sweet. Very sweet. Um, and uh, um, more fit for the American palate, generally mm. speaking. Um, which tends to be on the sweeter side. Um, it I tends to be more, please do. Um, now, sw swirl it around a bit, chew on it a bit. We call that the Kentucky Chew. That's delicious. It's, a, it's nice, easy drinking. Um, That's dangerous. It is. Because it, and now that you can see why it goes so well in cocktails, but, but that's it. But that's it. You see, the the sweet profile of it, and which is why Jack, the, the what we're most familiar with, most people start off with mixing with Coca Cola, yes, and you have correct. Jack and Coke, and it gets teenagers behaving badly. <laughs> um, and but it's, this it's, you it's don't need. To, you don't need Coca Cola. No, it's really Maker's smooth. Mark. It's you, very it, nice. You, you can present it neat, just as it is. Will I be able to tell the taste a difference in the taste profile? Oh yes. If I go wild turkey. Yes. Because remember now, wild turkey is, is uses rye as its flavor and grain instead of wheat. And this should and then give it even it'll sweeter profile. It'll, it'll actually give it a spicier profile. Spicier profile. Um, rye whisk, rye tends to be a much spicier grain where corn is very sweet. Now um, I see the, no, the nose on the maker's mark is far stronger than the nose on the wild turkey, mm -hmm. or maybe I'm losing my sensibilities already. Um, there's slight difference in proof. That this is just a slight lower proof. Um, what, what sort of proofs are we looking mark. at on these? Um, uh, we're, we're all, they're all in the range of 86 to 94. Wow. Huh. Whew. Yes, but spicy. But you see, yep, a lot you. spicier. This is a, a wake up, wake up. Yeah, yeah no, it gives you a little punch. That, that, yes. that is just before you go home. Yes. Um, uh, that's, that's on public transport. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not driving so, yourself. And, uh, and then the Woodford um, is, a, of all of these, this is the newest entrant into the market. This, this um, started in... in uh, uh, 1996. Mm -hmm. I was actually present at the distillery the day of the first bottling. Well, very good. Um, um, it was October 96, if I remember correctly. Um, oh, this is rich and warm big and soft and, warm and, 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 and woody and, yes. and everything else. It's um, been looked after. And, uh, and uh, it's a bit older. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, the, the, the age profile on Woodford is a little bit older than the other two. Um, mm, that's very mellow. Very mellow and warm. The but How long would that be aged for? Um, I don't know the exact number, but Three, it's around years? seven years. Se seven years, because the right. single malts tend to have the aging profiles, and the price goes up, uh, you know, in terms of the age of the whiskey. So the twelve-year-olds will be generally more affordable right. than the, the fifteen yes. and sixteen and twenty-one-year-olds, and then we get to the thirties, forties, and fifties. By which time you're having to sell parts of your anatomy <laughs> to, start <laughs> to start buying. Now, it. the one thing that is worth noting, though, um, and and this will explain a lot about the dichotomy between 
between Scottish whiskey and American whiskey. Um, in 1990, we began a study. Um, we partnered with Glen Morangi. Mm -hmm. We sent a barrel of Maker's Mark to Glen Morangi, and they sent a barrel of Glen Morangi to Maker's Mark, and we let them age. And the study went on for 12 years. And what we were able to determine during the tasting and sampling and sending of things back and forth was that uh, one year in a Maker's Mark warehouse was worth four to five years in a Scotch warehouse. Why? Well, for several reasons. Number one, there's a big temperature swing from summer to winter in mm -hmm. Kentucky. Um, that's about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Where in Scotland... Which is about, what, 22 degrees Celsius. It's huge, yeah? 36. Oh, what? 33. Okay. 33. Okay, that's big. Yeah, big. Where in... Uh, um, in Scotland, the swing is maybe two degrees Celsius. <laughs> very, very <laughs> yeah. small. The second is that the warehouses in Scotland are very, very humid. Mm. When you walk in a warehouse in Scotland, you feel like you have to pick your clothes off mm. be uh, because they stick to you from all the humidity. Where in Kentucky, the warehouses are very, very dry, and which aids in the movement of the, of the whiskey through the wood. The third thing is the Scotch guys use used wood while the American guys use new wood. And uh, all of those things conspire to make aging far more rapid in Kentucky. So when you mm. take all of that and put it together, a, a young-ish bourbon is four years. If you multiply that times four, that's 16, okay. and that I puts you, you in I the realm you. on scotch. How do you break into a market that is dominated by global brands in South Africa, which where the, the, guys, at, uh, the guys at Johnny Walker have been very aggressive in their marketing, yes. Shivers Regal, the big soft, the, the blends, the single malts. They, the blends have been very popular in South Africa. How do you take American culture from the South right. and bring it into a South African context that makes South Africans want to switch to these? Well, there's, there's two real big selling points. The first one is um, you do have the cocktail culture that's emerging. Um, Again, in some bars that I've visited, 50, 60 percent of all the spirits consumed now are cocktails. Yeah. Well, it's mostly vodkas and some yeah. gins. Um, certainly, the next logical step is to step into the whiskeys. And if you're going to do whiskey cocktails, you need American whiskey. Um, okay. So that's step one. Okay. Price points, um, we, we, we got to wrap. But price points, I would argue that's probably the priciest. That would be second, and that would be third. That's and, uh, approximately price correct. Can I tell you my favorite? Sure. I like that one. I like the Maker's ah. Mark. Um, but, but I like the names of, of whiskeys because you can, uh, do, do people deliberately set out to offend when they name bourbons things like Knob Creek and things like that? Or is there really a creek called? There really is a Knob Creek and it's a creek that, that there was a distillery along the, the banks of which Abraham Lincoln worked at it when he was well, a, then it must a, be a young person. Then that must be okay. Thank you for watching. Mr. Whiskey, thank you very much for having My us. My pleasure. This is the Maker's Mark. Dave Pickerel um, was instrumental in creating this particular tipple. There'll be more if we survive the night because we, he's not leaving until these are finished. <laughs> Till next time on The Money Makers, The Whiskey Makers. Good night. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.